Greetings and hello, Internet. Welcome to Saving Throw Show for tonight's episode of the RPG Exploration Society, uh, The Few and the Cursed. Uh, this is part one of our adventure into the worlds and to the wastelands of The Few and the Cursed. Uh, last week, we did uh, some character customization that was very, very fun. Uh, so if you missed that, you can always check out the pod to see all our, uh, picking our characters and, and doing that. But today, you're actually going to play an adventure with these characters that we put together. And to run us through that adventure, I will introduce you to Scott, who is our GM for tonight. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for uh, playing and being here with your characters. Uh, apologize if I sound funny. Some technical difficulties on my end, but everything should be good. So we're all good here. Uh, but I am Scott, the creator of The Few and Cursed. And so I'll be running this game for all of you with all of my secret knowledge up in my head that no one else has access to. Fantastic. Joining us in this uh, adventure is Eliza. Oh, you're muted. Uh oh. Uh oh. More technical ah, difficulties. There I am. <laughs> uh, I'm play. Uh, I'm Elisa Pearl. I'm playing the gunslinger and curse chaser Cassidy today, and very excited to be here. Right. Randy. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Randy Alvarenga. I'm playing Mr. Davis McLaren, scholar, doctor. Mister? I don't know. Doc. <laughs> uh, Ronald. Hi, folks. My name is Ronald, and I will be playing Amos Jacoway, farmhand and blacksmith. Oh, nice. Uh, and I will be playing Hamish uh, Gunderson, the outlaw miner, different from Amish. We didn't <laughs> plan that. Not related. I don't know why. We just picked weird names. But I will uh, shut up and pass things over to Scott to run us through this wonderful adventure. Okay. Cool. So as we established in the sort of character build session, like this world is this waterless world. So we're going to be playing around in that. And what that means is that the place where I have uh, set up for this adventure this time is actually what it would be underwater if we were in our current world. But that is that is not the case here. So hopefully everyone can kind of follow along with the fact that we're going to be out in the East China Sea, out in the desert. Right. And that's where we're going to be for for these adventures here on the show. Um, but the sands of the East China Sea have been unbearably hot for the last few days as you've walked from wherever you were before toward the city of New Jing. It's probably the hottest October you can remember, uh, but you've driven through the sands. You've come here to find work and information as rumors have been spreading that there's activity in Mongolia, not far to the Northwest that involve a man and his army of cursed creatures, or so they say, that all worship something called the white demon, or at least that's what the rumors are spreading. So there's pretty much a reason for kind of all of you to be around. For one thing, there's this cursed creature, there's the potential of cursed objects. Um, but another thing is that New Jing actually has a fairly decent supply of horses and cattle that they use to sort of feed their people. So every one of you has kind of a reason to be heading this way uh, if you aren't already together. So that's kind of the question uh, that I wanted to pose to you to sort of figure out you're going to all end up at the same place anyway. But the question is, do you know each other and have you been traveling with each other on the trail so far? That's yeah. That's that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. In, hmm. Hmm. I'm inclined for us all to know each other, but the like that's the question is how. Mm -hmm. So well, yeah, I would I already would be, be selling my only skill that would make me make sense for me to be out here. So I am hopping onto whatever caravan traveling group, like saying I will provide those services in order to get out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think I would be someone that you all have run into and maybe we've gone on adventures together, each one of you with me, because I always kind of pop up when there's some weird uh, monster or curse that's popping up. And so this is the exact circumstance where my character would just kind of start to show up and appear in the shadows. So you you only know me by my first name, too, by the way. No one knows my last name. Okay. Um, actually, Hamish, uh, since we already kind of, uh, broached the idea of me, po me possibly being like an, 
either an ex-convict or a like convict like that just happened to get the opportunity to stumble into being a farmhand maybe i like kind of know you from my past and yeah i broke result, you out of prison at least once that works that works and so i figured maybe to pay you back for some some pay you back for some sort of old um old uh old favor that i uh, like hey i've got a you know hey i've got a line on a you know on a on a straight gig coming up maybe you can get in something crooked and crooked in the meantime i like that that's fair i mean nujing is known for a active underground as it were uh there's a black market there's this the way that the city is structured from what you all know is that it's structured in a hierarchical society because it's made up of survivors from china and japan or those nations that once were called those things way before any of you were born um and so it has this sort of hierarchical society but as with any other hierarchical society there's also an underground a black market and so there's definitely jobs both both straight and like you know black market that are to be had so it makes sense for you to be traveling that way and then also for uh, Cassidy and Davis, like there's very obviously this curse, cursed object thing going on out there. So those are two good reasons for both of you to be going that way as well. So it totally makes sense for you to be traveling in the same caravan, if not starting out that way, definitely coming together at some point along the way uh, to be heading toward New Jing City. And it's, you know, sometimes when you meet travelers on the trail, you, you kind of go, I don't know about these guys, but, you know, these people that we run into. But if you know, there's safety in numbers, so surviving out there, setting up camp together, that'll pretty much link you in, especially if somebody's decent at finding water or processing water and others are not. It's like, well, I'll stick with this person since they can keep us alive. Um, so that's pretty simple to explain why you're all together as you come into New Jing City. Um, so I like where you guys are going with this. And so here we are. Arriving uh, at New Jing City, the city is at the center of the Okinawan Trench and the Okinawan Mountains, or what used to be the area, the island of Okinawa, is now a mountain plain that is to the east of this uh, city. And the Taiwan Plateau is to the southwest. The Okinawan Mountains rise up thousands of feet, blocking the city from sun for large portions of the day, making it a much cooler place than everywhere else around. So it's definitely the best place to have a city if you're going to have one out here in this area. Because everywhere else after a certain point just becomes flat um, all the way across, just flat open, hot desert um, until you get to some of the other plateaus that were once continents as people have told you, Randy, um, your character uh, Davis knows these things because you know, you're a scholar. So you know that once these were called continents, now they're just, you know, mesas essentially, just very big ones. Um, and that's sort of what's around. But as you look, come down into the trench, it's, it's much cooler in there because of that lack of sun for large portions of this. So it does get hot near the end of the day, but only for certain periods. The city itself is built up into the, the canyon walls. And there's a wall that surrounds it that's made of the ancient shells, or the shells of ancient abandoned ships that were once out here in the water that were just left when the water went away. And so they repurposed all of these ships and kind of made this wall around the city. And as you approach, you can see a whole crowd of people stuck outside and they're all trying to petition the guards to let them in for whatever reasons. They're trying to prove that they have some useful skill because that's really the way that you survive in this society. You provide some job or effort. And so that's how, you, that's how the city uh, lets you in. The council decides sort of what trades you're good at and so they're all petitioning these guards, but the guards, they seem to be kind of annoyed with this general cloud. They're just kind of glaring at everybody, but their rifles are slung over their backs. They don't seem to have them out in any aggressive way. And some of you who are maybe good at that sort of thing might wonder if they actually have ammunition for those things or if they're for show to keep people at bay, because that's sometimes a question around here. Um, but you can just see this whole crowd as people at the front are trying to make arguments, people in the back are trying to wait their turn to be able to, to petition their case. And amongst the guards, there's occasionally a single person that doesn't have a rifle, but instead has a sword. And you wonder if they're a member of the Hiquan or the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fist, which is the, the underground gang that sort of runs that black market. Uh, but that's what you see as you approach. So now that I've established this, how do you approach and what do you want to do in, in this crowd and these guards? 
Is it possible that any of us might have connections to the guards or would we be infamous in any way where they would recognize it, us? It's possible. It's possible. How, how um, be... Some of you maybe do have a little bit of a background and tradition, so it's possible. Um, so are you suggesting that maybe you want to approach the guards and be like, yo, it's, it's me. You know who I am. Let me in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See if that works. Sure. All right. What about the others? Oh, Hamish. I mean, he he's going to try and sneak in. There's no way. If, if the guards know who he is, he's already screwed. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I actually might, uh, Hamish, kinda, I, I would look at Hamish and is it clear? Like, would it be clear to me that, like, yeah, you're already scheming on how to get in? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Hamish is one of the shiftiest men you've ever met. Mm -hmm. He'd lean over to Hamish and be like, look, I'm going to try and get us in straight. Is that all right? I mean, if I, if I don't pull it off, you know, do what you do. But hey, if you can get us in there, brother, hey, go on for it. Yeah, I'm going to. And, uh, hey, Davis. Yeah. I, I think I got a line on this, but, uh, I'm going to, I got, uh, you know, I'm here for work. I can forage. I can, I can find water. Uh, the white, the white boy, he can, uh, he can act as muscle and, uh, you, uh, you can lay hands on folks that work. Sounds good to me. All right. And I'm going to actually try and try and just sell us. Okay. Okay. So as. As Cassidy approaches one of the guards, he turns and he you can see he's a little uneasy because uh, Cassidy's a little bit of a, of a terrifying figure when she approaches someone and they don't know who she is, right? I would I would say so, yeah. Yeah. She's She looks like very broody. Mm. Yeah. It looks like she knows what she's doing with her gun. It's not like at a weird angle. And if it's at a weird angle, it's on purpose kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, the guard is a little bit uh, leery as you approach, um, but he doesn't he doesn't draw the weapon on you or anything. He doesn't try to stop you. He lets you approach, and he says, I "Ain't I seen you before somewhere?" Yeah, you most certainly have. I'm here with some of my associates. We need to do some investigation in the city, help keep some people safe. Oh. I didn't. I didn't realize there was anything going on in the city that needed investigation. Yeah. Well, if you, uh, if you see us around, that means there's something that needs hunting. All right. Well, I gotta. I gotta talk to the captain. See if that's all right. But uh, who? Who? Which of these many people out here are your associates? I look around. Who of you is trying to be visible? <laughs> I am sitting there holding a box full of medical supplies, thinking that that's going to make it really obvious what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, I actually, yeah, I kind of am taken slightly off guard by by them, A, them knowing you, and B, like, you basically having a foot in the door already. So I, I actually, at that point, uh, Amos will kind of step forward and be like, and just give you a nod. Yeah, so I point out those two, and then I look over Amish at Amish is, is, he's behind Amos, but he's like, he's like not trying to stand, like you can see that he's standing behind, he's trying to, like he's not actively hiding his face, but he's not like showing off who he is. Yep, just kind of like. <laughs> kicking a <laughs> so, stone yeah, like, or something. He's, he's close enough that he's obviously with the others, but not mm -hmm. not in a way that anyone can really like get a good bead on what he looks like. That's what That's what I'm hearing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Point them out. All right. Uh, let me go talk to the captain. And you know, uh, uh, I, for, I forget what your name was, though. Curse Chaser. Cassidy. Cassidy. Right. 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 Okay. Uh, just we're right here. I'll go. I'll go talk to the captain. We'll be here. So he turns to go talk to the captain, and as you four are standing there waiting for him to come back, you notice a tension in the crowd. Like you can almost feel it from the people and it's, it doesn't seem to be aimed at you per se, but eyes are darting left and right. And some people's eyes are falling on you, but some are also falling on the guards. You're not sure what is going on or why they're so tense. Maybe it's the, the, the stories, the rumors of whatever's going on nearby, 
Maybe it's something else. But we're going to start things off here, and I'm going to allow all of you to make a perception roll to see if you can see some stuff happening in the crowd. All right. So for this, you're going to roll a D100 and try to get under your instinct stat. And if you're proficient in perception, which I think all of you are, then you're just a straight D100 roll. But if you're not, then you're going to roll with disadvantage. You'll roll an extra tens die, and you'll take the higher of those numbers. Okay. And then where do we see our instinct? It should be the top of the sheet. Top yeah, so the top sheet. of the sheet. Yeah, so all the stats are lined up on the top right underneath, like, your name and your, like, I straight up architects. failed. I got I failed, too. I got very close to failing, but I got a 42 under 45. Nice. Ooh, I, I got, got a... a 60, and I 50 is my number. But you said something about if we're not proficient in it, we rolled at disadvantage? or You'd roll at disadvantage. You're on an additional 10s die, and you would choose the higher of the okay, two numbers. I think I need to do that, because I don't think I am proficient in instinct. Let me look up your character sheets. I have them all here. I just didn't have them open in front of me. Uh, you are you are proficient in, in perception. Well, um, so instinct is the stat, and the skill is, oh, is perception. I see now. Oh, I'm on board. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, I see yeah. it. So I think everybody. I think everyone's actually proficient in perception. So I think in this crowd, you guys are all of your characters are awesome. fairly at, like good at seeing things and noticing stuff. But nope. it sounds like everybody failed except nope. for Davis. I think I passed. Oh, wait, you're supposed to go under. under. You're supposed to go under, yeah. You want to get as yeah, low as possible in this game. Yeah. I failed. All right, all right. Sounds good. So, Davis, uh, what you notice out of this crowd, what you see uh, is that, like, there's this all this tension, like I mentioned. Everyone else just sort of noticed this tension. They notice people, like, their eyes looking around. But you notice that a couple of the people right up front, they seem ready for something. Like, they're going to spring. And as you notice them, as your eyes kind of meet theirs and theirs kind of meet yours, they do. And in a swift motion, three of them pull off their ponchos and reveal that they're actually wearing some kind of leather armor underneath. And they put these wooden masks on their face that seem to be carved to look like demons. And in that same moment, when the rest of you see this, Davis saw it first and was aware of what was happening. When you see this motion, you also see these three pull out these long, wicked blades and cut down the first three guards standing there in front of the gate. Well, that is and, so, and so I throw you into some combat initiative Whoa. to get things started in this game. Yeah. So combat in this game, combat is broken into a combat round, which is, has, has four action phases. In the beginning, everyone's initiative score will determine where they go in order from highest to lowest. And then a minus five from everyone's initiative to start the second action phase. And if you still have initiative, then you'll take it, you'll have turns again. And then I'll do it again for the third action phase and the fourth one. Now, if there's nobody taking actions in like the fourth action phase, we just skip it and we go on and start the next combat round. This is for timing. So like if you were to throw a piece of dynamite, for example, it will go off of the next combat round or things like that. If you didn't had a special effect that affected your initiative or whatever, it would happen the next combat round. So that's sort of why it's breaking, broken down like this. But based on this, the three people that were acting first, they kind of have the jump on things. So they're all going to keep moving before you all take actions. And they just move forward, splitting apart a little bit, but using their blades, just flashing them as they cut down more guards in front of them. And that's what the three of them do before we actually come to Hamish and say, Hamish, you are the fastest one of the group, so you get to have the turn first. On your turn, you can take two complex actions and uh, a reasonable number of free actions. Free actions, they're free, so therefore we just kind of go, okay, that's probably enough of them. But the kinds of complex actions you can take are drawing a weapon, uh, attacking, moving one distance, uh, skill action, reloading, taking aim to give yourself advantage on your next attack, throwing things, you know, you get the picture. Um, and then for free actions, you know, things like talking or dropping stuff. And if you're lucky, you can make a quick draw roll and, you know, remove your weapon instead as a free action. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that you can do on your turn. You get to do two complex things. Okay. Uh, let's see. Am I proficient in athletics? I don't think so. Uh, oh, I am. Um, I think... I'm just, I'm going to try and lasso the, f f one of the people. Mm -hmm. 
I don't want to waste ammo on these people. They only have knives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So you, you want to lasso him. So yeah. you can do you can do two you can do one of two things. You can either uh, spend one of your complex actions to remove the rope from you know tied around your backpack or wherever it's at, or you can try to quick drive, which is a agility roll, and you're trying to get two degrees of success. Except I think in your case, um, do yeah. you have fast hands? I do. Yeah. So for you, you just need a success, and then you can draw that thing as a free action, and then you'll still get two complex actions. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to, to draw that real quick. Uh, beat my agility of fifty. Uh, I do not. I got seventy seven. Okay. Well, it's still hey, it's it's still yeah. fine to attempt it because it doesn't do any. It doesn't, you know, complicate things in any way. It just means that you had to take the action instead of doing it as a free thing. So yeah, he like pulls it. And he's like, ah, man, damn it. <laughs> and so you have the rope, and you want to go ahead and and do a wrangle thing to try to lasso yeah. one of these guys, right? I'll try and wrangle. Yeah. Let's try to wrangle, which is again under your agility. Yeah. Uh, um, bad. Another really bad one. I'm rolling very high, which would be good in other games, but that's not what this game's about. All right. All right. So you you miss. You just kind of miss. Now there is a way to mitigate that. If you wanted to try it, it might be a little early to use up your luck points. But the luck yeah. points are used so that you would you would just minus one from your current luck. Um, and then you would, from your current luck points, not the whole like luck stat, but the current luck points, and then you could re-roll if you wanted to. Uh, let's see. I I have a lot of luck. I'm a pretty lucky guy, but I think I'll I'll save it. Yeah, it's much better to use those a little bit nearer to the end of the adventures, as it were, because uh, they do reset at the beginning of the next session, right? So, thing to know. Okay, so your lasso goes a little wide. They're moving quickly, so you know it's not really your fault. It's them. They're moving around. You know, they're not like cattle or something that run in like a straight line. These guys are, you know, dumping and weaving. Amish has been teaching him how to how to lasso, and he's just like he's he's not quite getting it yet. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right then. Well, then it goes to Davis, who's the next fastest one in the group. I see just pandemonium break out, and he like puts his back against whatever like he was standing next to and is like oh i was not i was hoping i didn't have to do this uh he uh, i want to take a turn uh to mm-hmm. draw my bow and i want to okay. shoot at their legs <laughs> okay because i'm doing I a call shot to, to the them. legs yeah yeah i don't want to kill them but okay I, yeah I go ahead and roll if you get a success then you hit their leg and we'll go from there okay oh, okay okay well uh, and then that is just what stat that's under agility yeah it's under agility. Nope. <laughs> nope, not at all. 55. Okay. Uh, all right. <sighs> so that was a miss on that one, unless you wanted to use that luck. Uh, how many would it be to get? Ah, I need to. No, you just need to roll. Points. You just need one, and then you would re-roll it. Oh, I spend one luck point and re-roll? And then you re-roll. Yep. I'm going to do that. Okay. 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 Ooh, much better. Much better. That is a 44, <laughs> 44 uh, under 45. So. All right. Hey, that's still what we call a success in the world of rolling the dice. So typically the uh, target that you'd have would get a defensive action, which is where they would try to respond to your attack with some kind of defensive thing. But I'm going to say that for this beginning thing, and these guys are not really knowing that you're combatants, right? They're busy slashing down guards left and right. They're not paying attention. So your arrow penetrates the knee of one of the, the guys. And so you would roll your damage now, which in the case of an arrow is 2d4. That's what you're going to be rolling. Yeah. Whoa. I dropped one on the floor. Let me redo that. Okay, that is four total. All right, so he takes four damage to the knee, and now he is slowed because you hit him in the kneecap. So now he will have to take, if he wants to move any distances, he'll have to take two movement actions to do it because he's limping uh, from this arrow sticking out of his leg. Uh, Sorry. (laughs) Okay. After that, so following Davis is Cassidy. Okay. Yep. Seeing my two compatriots trying to... <clears throat> wrangle and or slow these two down. I think Cassie's going to go for what she does best, which is shooty shooty. Mm-hmm. And she's going to try to disarm as many of these 
bladed hands as she can. Okay. So she's going to try to shoot the blades out of their hands. Sure. And because you have the multi-attack ability, right, you can attack twice if you want to. Most people can't. Uh, though I will say that Amos has a repeating rifle, which also allows him to multi-attack with that. But only with that, right? Not as a whole thing. You just multi-attack. That's your thing. Uh, so you can. Yeah, you can shoot it too. That's fine. All right. Uh, so what you do is you're going to roll the D100, try to get under your ballistic scale, which I think for you is quite high. It is indeed. Uh, it is 85. Hmm. Record. 40. 40, yeah. Okay, so 85, so you got a 40 on 85. That's two degrees of success. That is that is more than enough to hit the weapons and try to disarm them. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll go with that. So you will uh, still roll some damage because you're aiming at the weapons. We'll see if you break them okay. as you hit them to knock them out of their hands. So the, for you, with the Peacemaker, that is 1d6 plus 3. D6 plus 3? Okay, 1d6 plus 3. Yes. 3 plus 3 is 6. All right, that will destroy the weapon as it goes flying out of their hand. It shatters, breaks at some weak point in the in the blade itself, breaking into a couple of pieces. Uh, but it goes flying out of his, out of the hand of the warrior who has no idea why that just happened. And now you can make your second shot. Okay. Yep. So literally, just boom with one hand, and then the other hand. Boom. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have two guns. <laughs> no, I think it's just one gun. But I think okay. you fan. You know, do that so. thing where you have it at your hip and you're like fanning it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh, 27. 27. That's even better than before. Uh, not quite three degrees of success. Still two. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, once again, go ahead and roll that damage. We'll see what happens. Ooh, five plus three, eight. Okay, mm -hmm. that one is also destroyed. So you have disarmed two of these attacking uh, people, whomever they are, these strangers that are killing people. Um, so they are both disarmed in your two pow pow shots all right all right that's everything you can do so now we're going to go to amos and say amos what do you want to do in this whole strange situation uh how many how many gar how many uh how many attackers are there total you've seen three okay uh and two of them are without weapons currently two of them yeah appear to have lost their swords in some you know exploding of gunfire that happened just now Okay. Um let's see. I suppose then I will um and there was the f the one that was slowed from Yes, Davis. and then one has an arrow in the knee, yeah. I'm going to actually try and close line that that one. Okay. Uh, just um just to like to bring the whole like try and bring the weapon quotient down down all all the way to all the, all the way, way. To none. Gotcha. And I'm assuming that is uh, like uh, fighting skill. That would be fighting skill. Yeah, that would be a brawl skill action. So yeah, you'd be trying to get under your fighting skill, which ain't great. But we'll see. Oh, actually, I got a twelve. Twelve. Okay. So because you're coming at this guy and he's just taking an arrow, he's actually now aware that there are other people in the crowd that are fighting back. So we'll see. I'm gonna roll this D100. Um, but I'm going to give him disadvantage because he has no idea what's going on. And we'll see if he can get out of the way of your clothesline. And 82 is not good enough to get out of the way. <laughs> so he absolutely uh, takes the clothesline. So for you, you're going to roll some damage. And then we'll see if he can maintain his balance. Um, for you, uh, with your fists, you do 2d4 damage, which is the same as an arrow, effectively. Okay. I only have 1d4 out, so I'll just roll That's it fine. twice. Yeah. Let's see three plus three, so six. Six, that is a decent amount of damage. Um, so now he's taken that much as well. So I will calculate that, and now I will make this roll to see if he stands up. Uh, no, seventy nine is not good enough to stand up. So he absolutely goes down from your clothesline. He is now prone, uh, meaning that if you continue to fight this guy, you have advantage because you're standing over him. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that is where we end the first action phase. Uh, actually, you had a uh, clothesline. I guess is just one action. Did you want to do anything else while you're standing over this guy? Um, can I draw? You can't attack him a second action? time because you used your fist. So that That's is a thing. Fair. But you can also do other actions. 
Uh, I actually want to. Could I draw a weapon? Yes, you can. Yeah, you can. I'm gonna draw my rifle and point it at him. Okay. I wouldn't. That's all. And and saying it directly to him if if he looks like he's gonna get like because you said he tried to get up. He he probably will. Yeah, he's he yeah. seems to be you know focused on the fight. Then then that. <laughs> okay, okay, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, so that ends the first action phase. We'll now enter the second action phase. I'm going to from everyone's initiative. Um, they will take their actions because they are super fast. Um, the one, the first one that was disarmed, he's going to do some kind of strange maneuver that appears to be trained in some way, like a martial art type thing, uh, and, and take down the next guard. He hasn't killed him. He's just, you know, knocked him off balance, and he seems to be trying to run toward the gate. The second one, however, uh, absolutely failed in his maneuver, and there's just a sort of grappling thing now happening between him and one of the guards, because um, he doesn't really know what happened to his weapon. Uh, but the one that is on the ground tries to get up, and so sort of jumping ahead a little bit, uh, I'm going to allow Amos, because you had the gun trained on him, to get a chance to react to him trying to stand up before I go to everyone else. Yeah, he's like he's going to try and shoot if he moves because he told him he would. He told him I wouldn't. Right, right. Uh, so for this, you're super close. Rifles get a little bit of disadvantage, but you also had it like right in his face. So why don't you just roll the damage for me and see what happens when your shot goes off? Okay, what's the damage on the rifle? Two uh, D four, same as your fists. That... Okay, let's see. So two. His punches are as strong as kicks. <laughs> uh, so three, actually. My punches are, are stronger than... <laughs> In this case, yeah. Uh, you know, because he was getting up, knocks the, the rifle aside a little bit. So he still grazed him with some damage. Um, but he does take the damage, so he rolls over into the dirt. Very clearly, like, taking a hit. Um, doesn't seem to be down, but maybe he'll reconsider trying to stand up again. We'll see. Uh, but but now we'll go to Hamish and say, okay, Hamish, now that you've missed with your rope, what do you want to do? Well, if we're if we're doing guns, I'm going to quick draw my gun. Okay. Uh, uh, 28 out of 50. Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. Uh, All right. So which one are you targeting? The one that's on the ground, the one running toward the uh, inside of the gate, or the one that's re like, sort of wrestling? The one's somebody? running to the gate. I'm going to shoot him in the back first. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so that will absolutely be 1d6 plus 3 damage. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, 1d6 plus 3. Because he's running away from you, not paying attention. And 8 damage. Attention. 8 damage! So he gets shot in the back and tumbles into the dirt. Then, uh, I, I, because I quick draw, I got another shot against the guy laying on the ground. Uh, 20 out of 75. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is only 6 damage. Okay. Uh, that guy gets shot with that second shot, that shot from you. And he does groan with it. He seems to be like now bending in pain from this shot. Uh, but now he's bleeding all over the place. My associate did warn you. <laughs> Fair. And... And to be clear, we only need one of you alive so you, you, for talking. Cool. All right, Davis. These guys are doing some stuff over there, shooting yeah. things and whatever. Uh, they're doing a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of blood everywhere. It's, uh, it's a little uh, disconcerting. He's used to seeing blood, but he's not used to seeing it sort of right in his face all the time in mm -hmm. this manner. Uh, and, and uh, I am also causing said blood. Uh, but he aims at the the. There's one more still standing, right? Yes, he is wrestling with a guard. They like they're oh, they've funny. grabbed onto each other. They're in like clench, where they're like grabbed onto each other and they're like trying to throw each other to the ground. But neither one seems to be making any progress. Yeah, that's not not the best place to shoot an arrow. <laughs> uh. Can I run and uh, like over there uh -huh. and then like knock him off or try to like 
take him on. Yeah. So they're not very far from me. One movement would be enough to get to him. So mm-hmm. one action to get to reach him. And then you wanted to try to I, knock him. Yeah. Like I want to knock him back. So he falls back over so that the guard has more leverage when he All right. goes yeah. to attack later. So that would be a brawl action then. So mm-hmm. that'd be Which I'm not step. good at. But... You're not proficient. So you roll disadvantage. All right. Uh, that's one more. D10. Let me go on with the higher there. Yeah, no, nah, nah, bro. <laughs> you get uh, over to him, you grab onto him to try to throw him down, but he seems to be, you know, solid footed or something. He doesn't go down when you try to throw him, but now he has two people sort of rocking him back and forth, so we're, we're not sure what's going to happen. I'm like, man, Amos always makes this look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cassidy, it is your turn to do something. Okay. Uh, so there's this just this one. There's the yes. There's one lying face first in the dirt. Doesn't seem to be doing anything. There's one also lying face first in the dirt, but he's got Amos standing over him with a rifle. And then there's the one who's wrestling with now both Davis and a guard. Okay, and they're close to the the gate, right? Yes, they are close to the gate. All right, so I'll go over there and. I'd like to, if I can, kind of interpose myself between them and the gate. Mm-hmm. And then, hmm, hmm, what to do? Because shooting runs the risk of shooting my friend mm. and the guard. But I also have some other things I can do. Maybe, God, I don't know, maybe like intimidate, actually? Mm hmm, mm hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna that is the thing to... you could do for sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna try to intimidate this person, and say, so yeah, I'm gonna come up behind them. Yep. Put myself in front of the gate, and as they're mm-hmm. tussling with the with the guard and Amos, I'm gonna say loud enough for them to hear, but in my like moody voice, I'll say, "We've got you surrounded." Mm-hmm. Sorry, my Apple Watch is talking to me. Um, <laughs> forget that. Okay. Starting over. Uh, I'm gonna say, "We've got you surrounded. Your friends are down." You're not getting it out of this one in one piece, champ. Why don't you give up now? Yeah. And are you using your gun in any way? Yeah, I'll have it out, you know. All right. So we'll go ahead and give you advantage on this roll because you have this out and you're trying to intimidate someone. Pretty pretty slick. So uh, you'll roll an extra tens die and you'll choose the lower of the two tens dice. Okay, tens dice. Okay, and then... My intimidate mm. is under charm, charisma, yep. I mean. Yeah, it's under your charisma stat. Uh, you are proficient, so you're all good there. Oh, right. And am I wearing my calico vest? Uh, yes, but that affects your charm, because that affects how oh. like smooth you look. And you're all trying right, to I scare see. someone, hence the, the gun, which is giving, giving you advantage. Thank you. All right. So uh, they're both not mm-mm. 98 and 58. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's not quite good enough. Yeah. Do you want to use any of your luck points? Hmm. Mm, yeah, I do actually. Okay. Okay. So is that just a reroll? You're gonna reroll with that advantage. You just reroll the oh, roll sweet. as it was. Oh, that's totally worth a luck point. Okay. Oops. Yeah, oh my god. 275s. Okay. The desk just don't want you to intimidate this guy. I mean, I think but I'm you know talking what? too low. I'm like, yeah, da, da, da. he's probably like, <laughs> mm-hmm. and there's a lot of stuff going on, right? It's a bit hard to hear you. <laughs> yeah. Uh but but you know, now he has three people around him, so more than likely on his turn he's not gonna be able to try to brush past everyone and get through the gate. That's certainly not gonna be a thing now. Uh, especially because you put yourself between him and the entrance. Mm-hmm. All right. Yep. Uh, Amos. Um, let's see. So we've got one down, one bleeding uh, and down. And the guy, uh, the guy still trying to wrestle with uh, Davis and the guard. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. So wouldn't I'm actually going to try and intimidate as well. Um, okay. To try and get this to stop, because I don't want to. I don't want any of us to waste any more ammo. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Uh, is that like, is that a, is that a, like, a, would, is that one action? Like, or would that be like. So, yeah. So it, intimidate would be a one action. You're trying to stop somebody from doing anything. And if they do what you want, if you succeed and they do what you want, then you can probably just like not use your extra action if you don't want to, or you can, if, depending if you have an idea or a plan, like if you want to move away, for example, that'd be reasonable. Okay. Gotcha. Let's, let's, let's try and intimidate, like, just to, 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 to set the tone. Sure. Um, and he's gonna, he's gonna, like, since I shot, he's, since he fired, he's actually gonna, like, chamber another round to, like, ex like, uh, shoot mm. the, uh, the spent shell out. It's like, ahem, I don't think you, uh, were listening very closely to my compatriot. She said, we have you surrounded. You don't want to end up with you. You don't want to end up with your with your nether regions in the dirt like your homie over there, do you? And that that'll be my intimidate. Okay, go ahead and uh, make your your intimidate roll with against your charisma with advantage because you did the thing with the rifle and stuff. Okay, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Will a thirty under fifty-five do it? That will that will do it. Yeah, for sure. So the intimidate and charm skills are used effectively the same way. Where if you succeed, then you convince the person to do something for you. The difference is the long-run amiability of the character, right? If you intimidate them, they're going to be more antagonistic towards you in the future. But I mean, these guys are already killing people, so they're pretty antagonistic already. So it's fair. Uh, but if you try to do it on a shopkeep, for example, right, you might make them your enemy. Um, sure. But but right now these guys are already enemies, so you're totally good. So he hears what you're saying, turns to look at you, sees the rifle, has two guys having holding on to him, and another person standing in his way from getting in the gate, and so he surrenders. And that is his response to your words. Okay. Um, and uh, does it look like the guard is actually going to step, like, is actually going to just seize him? Because yep. if not, That's, uh, okay. that looks like what he's probably going to do. I mean, he was already trying to deal with this guy anyway. We good? Looking, looking around at everybody because he doesn't know if there's more coming. It does appear as the rest of the crowd doesn't seem to be doing anything aside from backing away from all of this chaos. Uh, the guards kind of in mass move forward, their rifles out and they start uh, like one goes over to stand over the guy that fell in the dirt. Uh, one steps up to right next to you. Like he's ready to do something with the guy on the ground. And, and a couple of them go over to the guy that's standing there that has surrendered. And, and that would be the end of the combat as you have effectively removed all the combatants from the fight. All right, then. Yeah, I gotta say, I like this town already. You would. The, the guard that was going to get the captain comes back from around the, the wall of this like ship, right, that they're using as a wall. He comes out from around it with the, somebody who appears to be slightly higher ranked than everyone else. He's got a different colored uh, placard like wood thing on his shirt that indicates that he's got some kind of rank. Everyone has these things. There's like small pieces with little symbols and stuff, but this one is a little bit larger, has a little bit of a more prominent symbol in it. He steps with this guard and he says, well now, that's some mighty fun work from the four of y'all. I guess uh, Bobby here was right. You are helpful. Just doing our job. Well, I appreciate that. And he, he sort of snaps his fingers and like points, and the guards start trying to tie up the, uh, the people that were attacking. Um, the one that's laying on the ground that, you know, was attempted to be wrangled and then was knocked down by Amos, he dropped his blade. The guards don't seem to notice this curved wood laying on the ground, but they, they put some ropes around him. He's like, oh, and he says something in a language that none of you understand. Um, and the guy, the guard that's sort of picking up goes, I don't care if you've been shot. 
you don't try to kill people and you killed some of my friends and just drags this guy away as he's continuing to speak in the language none of you know i'm gonna pick up that okay. knife yeah and i'd like to try to remember what he said just by like mm -hmm. phonetically or something sure easy enough easy enough we'll have you make an intelligence roll a little bit later to see if you actually stuck it in your brain can I try to identify what it is? The blade? Just the language. Oh, maybe the blade. Oh, it's the blade. I the language? Thinking, yeah. The, the language is some kind of Asiatic language. Um, you've never encountered it before, so right now you have no reference point. But if you get into the city and you can like cross-reference its library, you might be able to figure it out. Okay. Especially if you've got a friend who tried to memorize the phonetic sounding of the words. Okay. Awesome. Are any of the three combatants still here? Oh uh, yeah, like they're still the they they're dragging the one away. One is dead, but the one that was that surrendered, he's just kind of like they're tying him down, so he's just kind of kneeling as they tie his hands and feet together. Do okay. I get the sense that people would be upset if I began to rifle through the corpse of the man I murdered? <laughs> <laughs> Probably, right? That would that would go against this whole thing about you being helpful. Um, but you said you scooped up the blade, so at least hold on to that for yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, being near, if I'm near the one who's kneeling and getting tied up, mm -hmm. first of all, is he still wearing the mask? He is still wearing the mask, yeah. Ah, so I'd like to just get a closer look at that mask. Sure. I also um, want to draw it. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so both of you can, uh, this would actually be an academics role to see if you can figure out what the mask is, but I'll describe it to you if you, whether or not you succeed. Okay, um, academics. I, I got don't a, have that. I got a seventy-five out of seventy-five. <laughs> I was nice. hoping you would roll well because I don't. I mean, that is. I mean, it's still. It, it oh, out of seventy-five, okay. you said? Uh, yeah, he succeeded. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll roll just for fun. <laughs> yeah, with that disadvantage from not being proficient in it. With disadvantage, my worst is, is uh, forty-six. Okay, I mean, forty six still isn't super bad, uh, but maybe yeah. for you, I don't know what your stat is. Cause... My intelligence is twenty. So. Oh yeah, no, that's just that is not good enough to know anything about this. Yeah. Um, but Davis, this is uh, sort of this traditional demon mask that you'd usually find in like Japanese culture. It's called like a hanya. It's a it's a sort of oni mask this is sort of ogre thing it's got horns it's got big teeth and big eyes um but it's it's just this mask that's supposed to be intimidating it doesn't have any special features in any way they're clearly trying to just be scary by their outlook um but it is it is common they used to be around they used to people that traded with japan used to like send them around so you've seen them before in books some drawings that you've seen uh, especially as you were in the region, kind of trying to figure out what was going on. You've definitely seen these in drawings and art. It's on art and stuff. So you've seen yeah. it before. So as Cassidy's looking at it, uh, he he puts down his pack and starts rummaging for a book. And he's like flipping through it. And he's like, I'm not quite sure if this is right, but I think this might be. And he relays all of that information to you. But it's more like more than because I know I uh, everybody was like, He's very much the, uh, the, you know, well, actually, guy, I, I don't <laughs> think that's the case because I think a lot of him is trying to, like, be helpful. And so his knowledge is more like, this may be what it is. I, I don't know. I've, I've never seen it in real life. Kind of, more, more like, he's smart. He doesn't know that he knows as much as he knows. <laughs> the uh, captain of the guard is standing right there. Here's you talking, and he goes... Yeah, we've seen them before. You know what they're saying? Oh, yeah, the language is just a common Mongolian, as it were. Uh, but we've seen these masks before. These people, they they call themselves the Fallen Immortals. They're a group of bandits, mostly. They got any? They got any particular reason for wanting to breach the gate other than uh, gainful employment, so to speak? Well, I'm not entirely sure. I know they've been harassing some people outside the city, usually trying to steal their water and stuff. But I think that the council has some more knowledge on that. And actually, based on the way you all handled yourselves just here at the gate, 
I think it might be best if you spoke to someone from the council, perhaps the dingo uh, or perhaps, um, I don't know, UG, someone. Uh, and I'll put that word in if you want to speak to them, because I think you might be useful, not just on my guard, but in general for strangers coming into town who take care of our business. That's not something you see every day. I think we'd be happy to have a word with with that person. Ain't nothing wrong with talking. Yeah, and if you need help moving that body around, I, I, I don't mind one bit. <laughs> no, I think I got enough men to move that around. And the people start trying to move toward the gate at this point, and a few of the guards step up and they're like, yeah, no, no, he says, no, no, everyone will go through the regular process to determine your viability in the town. He's like, hold on, I got a business to take care of, but y'all might want to check out the, go check out, walk around the market or whatever, maybe meet at half five later today. We'll try to see if we can send someone to get you. But if you're doing up there, then the best place to be for the council to find you is Old Jing. It's that gambling house down in the, up by the houses. But high five right. is the saloon enough. I think strangers like you might find your time there. High five saloon and old J, you said? The gambling house? Old Jing. Named after the old city. Old Jing. Got it. Uh, you got uh, like a, a library or some kind of sitting room from a, from a man here? Uh, Davis? Yeah, there's something of the sorts. Travelers have been leaving... You know, things behind, maybe to trade them for ration cards or whatever. So I'm sure that down at what what we call kind of city, the city center, there's a little library slash records building. That's where we keep all that stuff. I don't think anyone sorts through it, though. You might have to sort through it yourself to find anything useful. But we do have the stacks of leftover materials that aren't getting burned in people's homes to, you know, heat them. All right. Uh, Couple he, few bibles up in there. He gives you a little nod, Amos, for 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 thinking of him. <laughs> you need anybody to to you need anybody to go with you? Oh, uh, oh yeah. Uh, I, I would definitely appreciate it. I I don't know. I've never studied anything about this town, so even though I've heard of it, uh, I obviously don't know anything. And um, you can definitely handle yourself better than I can. So. Yeah. There ain't nothing so. to it, Davis. That one town much like t'other. You just walk around, uh, find a ruckus, get into a tussle, get a little uh, drunk, find some company. It's all the same. What if we want to skip the ruckus? Um, well, I I guess you could avoid a ruckus, but I ain't understand why you'd do that. Uh, uh, it might behoove us to all stick together. Uh, maybe, uh, Maybe uh, cancel out our our, uh, our various uh, our various uh, shortcomings, aka Hamish. I don't want you getting any mess that's gonna blow back on the rest of us when you when nobody's looking at you. Now, I want you to name at least five times that's happened. No, six, seven times. You might want to bump that up a couple of digits. <laughs> okay, well I don't remember all of them, so I can't be held accountable. Mm hmm. So, uh, old Jing's eventually, but, uh, y'all mind, uh, y'all mind running by this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, sort of library, see if Davis can figure something out. Right. Don't mind at all. All right. So entering the city, the first thing that you encounter when you get past the gates is the market. It's primarily where all the tradesmen and like blacksmiths have these little, these little overhangs, these little awnings where they're working on stuff that sort of keeps the, the heat off of them while they're forging things or fixing stuff. They sell everything in the market from like shoes to, you know, metal things to armor, like everything you can possibly imagine being sold in the market for water. Uh, but you can see everyone's passing around, instead of actual water, they're passing around these little blocks of wood uh, that have this symbol on it that you all kind of recognize because you've, you're traveling in this area as the symbol for water, at least for these people. So there's some kind of tokens that they're passing back and forth instead of the actual water. You don't see anyone carrying any actual 
water skins aside from yourselves or any canteens or anything. And that's not typical. Usually when you come into a place like this, they are handing actual water back and forth to each other or, you know, other things. But for the most part, water is the most important thing. So for this to be these little tokens, it is strange. But this is probably your real first time inside of New Jing, uh, even though you may have been in the area for a while. Um, but that's what you see happening in the market. In the past, the markets, when you start getting into just random structures, some of them appear to be like the saloon with the, the you know the words high five written in multiple languages on it, one of which is English. And then you have just other buildings that don't have any markings on them. And then you have a stretch of these very haphazardly built homes, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it. They're more like lean-tos leaning onto each other, and you're not quite sure how they're all standing. But it feels like if one were to go down, it might be like dominoes, and they'd all topple around each other. I mean... I would really like to check that uh, library out first uh, for like what I'm specifically wanting to try to look for is any mention of a white demon in any sure. records that we can come across. Absolutely. It takes you a minute because aside from high five being marked, most of the rest of the buildings aren't, but you eventually get to a structure where, you know, it's kind of that old style where everything is on like a boardwalk on either side. There's this main thoroughfare in the center and so you have these structures, and then one of them, its doors are open. And when you look inside, you just see stacks of things and some people with these like larger wood blocks on their hanging around their necks and stuff, sort of standing around, sorting through it. Uh, but there's definitely a stack of unsorted books laying around in there. You get the feeling that that's the place you're trying to go. Oh. Hey, is this the library? Oh, uh, yes, sir. This is the library. I don't found it. As it were. Uh, thank you, uh, Hamish. Um, we would like to peruse your uh, knowledge that you have here. Uh, I know it's not organized, and I promise you I will be very careful on everything I do. I mean, sure. The city council claims to own all of that, so I think if you take something out of here, you got to leave a token or something in exchange, but otherwise... Uh, yeah, you can you can sort through all you want. Perfect. And uh, you see him just stretch, and he gets really animated in the way he walks inside the library. He's just, this is him all day. <laughs> uh, and as soon as he does that, he's going to start looking through for, for records. Uh, probably, what do I know about the white demon just from rumors or anything I may have heard? Well, why don't we have you make the uh, academics role to see if you can sort of figure it out. And for your case, because you're a treasure hunter, right? Mm -hmm. You have that dark knowledge special ability. So you'll have advantage on this role because the white demon falls into that cursed creature, cursed object category mm -hmm. that you know so much about. All right. So that's going to be a 25. 25 out of 75. That is mm -hmm. three degrees of success. So, or two degrees of success at least. Um, yeah, two degrees of success. To bring up your character sheet. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely good enough to know some things about that. Uh, 25 is, yeah. So you know that, um, actually for academics, sorry, this is the thing, no, you actually, for academics, you actually roll with a 90. That's actually what your stat number is for that because of that plus 15 over there for being trained mm -hmm. in academics. Oh. You're actually quite efficient at that. So you're rolling under a 90 for the academics. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would uh, not quite still put you there, but that's still a much higher number to work with. Um, so you are aware that the white demon is a creature that while people say is not a cursed creature, uh, you and many others believe that it is, but no one is quite sure what the object tied to it is. However, the entire nation of Persia was under its thumb for a while. Technically, there was a guy uh, and you don't really know his name, but there was a person who was in charge of the nation. And that person had made some deal with this white demon thing. And so everyone was under him, but that was recently overthrown. So where the white demon is, no one knows. 
Um, but you know that it is a large undying creature that supposedly comes straight from hell, as the stories say. But in the academic circles, right, you you know that that's probably more like a cursed object that is floating around somewhere. Right. And so they say that it's this 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 person. I don't know, but it, it definitely seems like it might be a cursed object. Hmm. So we're you talking for... to me this whole time? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Segue from that to me saying the same thing. <laughs> so it uh, sounds like we're looking for either the object itself or more than likely someone who has been corrupted by it. Exactly. And I mean, the last telling of it was in what was once like the area of Persia. Uh, that's kind of a ways away from here. So, uh, but to, to hear these stories, there's definitely a lot here that we can figure out about it, especially if, if anyone in town might know something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the rumors were that, that this sort of army of people that are led by some kind of cursed thing have moved through Mongolia, and that's why you're here. Because Mongolia, this is probably the cl largest city close to what was once Mongolia. Uh, so searching through the the books, you're able to find some things. There's a lot of different books in there. Um, there's some stuff that tell you some of those stories. Somebody's journal uh, where they were from somewhere in that area. They were aware of this whole Persia thing. And then when the fall of the White Demon happened, they migrated their way this way. And thus their journal ended up here in New Jing City. Um, but they weren't directly related. So it's not extremely useful information, but it is still useful information. And it gives you the idea that the migration that they did was also kind of a mass migration that many people fled when they were free from the tyranny of this, this creature and the person that served them. And the army of people whose phraseology you can't quite understand, but you get if you were to translate it with a neat little another secondary academic role, you might be able to translate what this phraseology is for the oh, term they let's, give. Let, let's try that. <laughs> that is a 31. Under yeah, 75. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so the phraseology that they use is fallen immortals. Mm, mm. Uh, hey, Professor, do we have reason to believe that those demon masked folks outside the city are uh, maybe could help lead us to the object? It, it, it could definitely be possible. Um, I'm seeing this statement here several times, and if my translations are correct, it, it, it might be a fallen immortal, which is, is what the that gang is called, right? Mm. So, and weren't that what that guy said? Yeah, exactly. So, oh, if yeah. we, so if we can, the, uh, what was the thing? Oh, wait, let me try to remember it. Can I try to remember the, yeah, no, you can make it, make an intelligence roll if you succeed. It's not a, it's not a skill, so it's just a straight roll. Right. If you see, then you can remember the phrase. Intelligence, <laughs> this will be difficult. Mm -hmm. Nope. 58. Uh, yeah, so intelligence for remembering things, the action of remembering things is an intelligence role, and so 58 is a failure. You can't quite remember. You can you sound out a bunch of words, but you're not entirely sure that that's exactly what he said. Um, and for for Davis over here, the, the, the whatever she said does not match with anything that you've been figuring out based on this journal yeah. at all. Like Who knows what that was she just said. Yeah, yeah I'm but just making strange sounds like. But I mean, you're 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 at least uh, trying, which is better than than I was. Uh, but I think one one way we might be able to learn some more is if we can either convince the guard to let us talk to the guy, or we go in there the sneaky way. And he looks over at Hamish. <laughs> well, I mean, breaking into a prison. Can't be much harder than breaking out. Uh, but there is a way uh, to get me maybe in a cell next to them. Uh, now, we've already, don't we already have an audience with, uh, with, uh, 
can't hurt to just ask him, right? I mean, not that I, not that I, uh, not that I was, uh, was, wasn't expecting Hamish to end up in, end up behind bars at some point, but I ain't trying to hasten it. I just figure it's going to happen anyways. I might as well get it over with. <sighs> Small miracle. Maybe we'll keep you, keep you, keep your, uh, keep your behind out of bars for at least right. a couple more hours. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe we just ask, ask nicely once we, uh, once we're in front of uh, the dignitaries here. Well, I found in life it's best not to ask for permission because they can say no. It's best to just take it and run away. Uh, and that's been working out good for you so far, Hamish. Hey, I'm still kicking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So having spent some time looking through the books and reading some of it, kind of a slow and boring day for everyone, except a really exciting day for Davis. Uh, well, how do you guys want to handle this now? Where do you want to go? Do you want to go to Old Jing, the gambling house that's apparently somewhere, or the High Five Tavern saloon thing? Or do you want to just go find a house, see if someone will let you stay in a house? Well, um... They did they say they would come and find us? Or, they did, or... yeah. The guard said that he would talk to the city council and that they would find you. Okay, but he um, recommended uh, he recommended going to High Five or Old Jing if you wanted to be found, essentially. Yeah, let's let's set ourselves up to be found with the with the idea that like once they come find us, one of our demands will be to like actually talk with uh, talk with one of the uh, one of the the uh, the prisoners if that's cool with everybody else now uh randy real fast did davis organize the books while he was sorting through them in any way he organized the the ones that made sense for what he was looking for so sure. there's now a stack of like the ones that have that information and then ones that were like deemed not even relevant to like look into further <laughs> so as you go to leave uh, this sort of larger, older guy with one of the larger uh, wooden placard things around his neck. He, he stands stands kind of in your way and goes, Oi! And he just looks at you, all gruff, pretty angry-like. And then he he motions for you to open your hand. Uh, is this what you mean? And I open my hand. <laughs> and then he, he, like, puts his hand out flat. Oh, and then he reaches into a, a little pocket. He pulls out one of these tokens that people have been handing back and forth to each other. He puts it in your hand. He goes, "Days work. Gotta gotta pay." Oh, uh, yes, payment. Thank you, kind citizen. I am very glad for it. And he sort of gnaws on it a little bit and goes, "Oh, that's disgusting." <laughs> <laughs> and puts it in his pocket. Who, who knows how many hands that that particular token's passed through at this point? It, this is the this is the wild west, my friend. If that's what people are worried about, <laughs> <laughs> fair. But then he gets out of your way. He was not trying to stop you. He was just trying to make sure that you didn't leave without getting paid, because you know you might have complained to someone in some hierarchy somewhere, nice. right? So he wanted to make sure that you left with your payment. So they were, they are definitely uh, using these tokens for. Some kind of currency, right? So I yeah. I don't know what I'd spend this on. I'm so used to this using water. So, well, if you're unsure, I can hold on to it for you. I'm definitely not trusting you with my 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 rock or whatever this is. Little little wood square wood, block. Wood with square a block. On it. You this is my. You learn it, Davis. You, you learn it. <laughs> All right. So which uh, which place do you go? Do you go to the saloon or the, or the gambling house? house. Mm. 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 Saloon? Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think Cassidy is actually going to say I wouldn't mind wetting my whistle with a, uh, you know, 
wait, I don't even know what they drink in this world. But... Yeah. <laughs> They drink. They drink uh, all of the things that you drink in a wild Westian world. Like they do. Water is obviously the most sought after thing, but second to that, you might get some kind of alcohol. Um, however, it usually has the sort of opposite effect that drinking water does. So, you know, it's sort of a game that you play. But since alcohol is not nearly as important as water, it tends to be a little bit cheaper to buy. You know, because yeah. there's a lot more of it laying around that people don't want. Yeah, so Cassidy's going to say, I wouldn't mind wetting my whistle with some water if if uh, we can find some at the saloon. I mean, I got a thirst. I don't know about for water, but, you know. Yeah, all right. Uh, and since we got since we got a we got a date to keep anyhow, may as well. All right. Going into the saloon. You walk up to it. You, it's got those double doors that you usually find in these kinds of places where they go, they open both ways, right? And they kind of like flop open the flop close and the do, 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 thing as you walk through them. Um, as you go through, you can hear the music that's kind of playing from it. There's a harpsichord. Someone's playing somewhere inside as you get closer. It's very obviously a hop in place as it were. But when you get inside, despite the music, it is really subdued. There's a few people kind of hanging around at the tables. They seem to be playing some cards, but they don't seem to be playing for any kind of stakes that you can notice in any way. There's definitely none of them tokens on the table. Um, but there's just maybe some friendly games of like, well, I win. Okay, cool. Let's move on. Um, there's a few uh, other people in the place that are not playing cards that are just kind of hanging at the tables. Then you have the standard bar with the barkeep standing there wondering what you're doing. And then up above, there's a staircase that goes up, and that's where the harp squirt is, at the bottom of the staircase. There's a young lady playing. And up at the above, there's a couple of ladies that seem to be hanging out in dresses, clearly bored. Very, very bored. I think Hamish is going to walk up to the bartender. You're muted, and go, Eliza. And go, uh, my good sir, uh, uh, how how are you doing on this fine day? Doing pretty good. He says as he pulls out a glass and just wipes it for no clear reason whatsoever. He's probably wiped the same glass a hundred times before. Well, my companions and me are uh, looking for uh, drinks and entertainment. Uh, uh, I, I, now we are new in town. I'm wondering. Uh, besides these uh, wooden tokens, is there any sort of barter that happens? <clears throat> I got this nice knife. It means a lot to me, but you know I'm willing to trade it. He looks around, see if anyone else is kind of listening. The harpsichord music is kind of covering a lot of the conversation, so he leans in and he says, "I ain't supposed to accept nothing but ration tokens. If you don't have one." I ain't supposed to accept nothing. But I got two options for you. One one of those coins? Or... Yeah, them, them little wood blocks with the symbols on them. Is that only one drink? That would be one drink of water. That would uh, be a whole water skin of water if you went over to the ration house. Good to know. But, no taking. But uh, you could trade a ration token in for a whole bottle of Tennessee bourbon if you wanted it. I look How... at everyone else and I go, you said you wanted to wet your wristle, right? I just wanted some water personally. Uh, and uh, to be quite on to be quite honest, considering the dust up at the front of the at the, the front of the gates, we're probably already owed a little bit more more than more than uh, a bottle of bourbon. Mm -hmm. You say that in front of the bartender? Mm-hmm. I make he sure to look back. at him when I say it too. He leans back and goes Oh, hey now, sorry, didn't realize who I was talking to. Hey, everybody, the heroes are here. And some of the people start looking at you. He's like, all right, standard tradition for heroic behavior is everyone give me ration tokens so I can make sure that these heroes get a drink. And some of the people in the room start grumble a little bit, but they come up and they set their tokens on the bar and then go back to their, their chairs. We sure all right, now this friends. is, uh, looks like six here, uh, Glasses of water. Thank you. Well, thank you for your 
kindness, everyone. Oh, no, thank you. I heard you took down a couple of them bandit types that have been robbing people outside the town, so this is on us. Well, it was quite heroic of us, I must admit, but it's just part of our jobs. And uh, the water is, the water is, like, not great. It's, it's water, uh, but it's foggy, for sure. I lean over to Cassidy, and I'm like, I don't think this is going to get us a lot of friends in town. Why do you say that? I mean, if I were made to give away my my ration tokens, I'd I'd be kind of mad, right? Mm, yeah. I look around. Do any of them look not pleased? I mean, they all seem a little not pleased, but now that they've handed over a ration token on your behalf, some of them walked over to this wooden board that's in the side of the room that seems to have pieces of paper like pinned on it with various items. Um, clearly, you can see so the, the, the standard across the world symbol for like this much water for this bounty. And there's a picture mm-hmm. of like a person or, you know, sort of a weird sketch or just some scratchy writing. Uh, so a few of those people who hand over their tokens are now looking over there to see if there's any extra work they can pick up. Mm-hmm. Well, I wouldn't worry too much about it, Professor. I think uh, it looks like they're already on their way to get earning themselves some more tokens and rations. And, and Cassie's going to like swipe her foggy water glass and like just chug it down. And you all like in this moment remember how young she is because as gruff and mean and stuff she seems, she is this very slight five three teenager uh and you can see like her thirstily goes like up the water you're like oh yeah this is basically a kid and like amos will very quietly like take it easy i want to savor it (sighs) tries to make it to where nobody else really hears that yeah yeah it's just really thirsty (sighs) and and amos sort of like very like he's he's a larger gentleman, but he note that he sort of very gingerly sips at his water. It's at this time, of course, that I realized we didn't describe your characters, so it might be a good idea to describe how you drink this water and what you look like while you do it. Well, um, as I said, he's a larger gentleman, um, uh, mid thirties. Um, He's got kind of a, a, a because he, he has a, a background in, in smithing, he does have like a uh, like a blacksmith build, like huge forearms, um, like kind of stout, um, like very sl- like his like hair is like not like wild, but like, you know, reasonably kempt, like slight, slight graying at the temple, like premature graying at the temples. Um, and um his clothes are like kind of general frontier clothes that you can tell that he kind of layers to layers to like offset the fact that he doesn't have much. So you'll notice like, you'll notice that like there are some like, uh, like kind of burns and stuff from like smithing in some of the, in some layers of clothing and things of that nature. Um, You also notice that he's got a um, paperback book in his back pocket that is very weathered. Um, you like if you've hung around him enough, you know that like when everybody else like is sleeping or like doing something else, he's off in a quarter reading. And as I said, he's very gingerly like taking sips of water because like it, very clear he knows how precious e- it, like water is, even though this is like kind of tepid and and foggy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, next to him is Cassidy, who, as I said, is a, a slight teenager, teenage girl. Um, she's wearing a wide brim hat and kind of a poncho cloak mixture, both black. The hat and the, the poncho slash cloak are black. Mm-hmm. Um, she kind of always has like a very serious or sour look on her face. Um 
but she, not, none of this hides the fact that she has a very youthful face. Um, but of course, when she pulls out her gun, people don't notice that because mm -hmm. she's very quick on the draw and she's a very good shot. Mm -hmm. She has a tiny touch of maybe spookiness, but also like an air of piousness to her mm -hmm. that you might pick up on, especially this party because you've spent some time with her. All right, uh, I'll go next. Uh, you see this uh, sort of bookish young man. He's mid-20s, probably about 25 is where I landed, uh, wearing a nice shirt, which like relatively nice for, for a traveler, uh, with a bow tie, which is not normal probably for anyone out on the trails. But uh, he wanted to do his best because his dad told him to look to impress. Uh, the other thing he carries is a, a shawl he uses to cover his nose whenever there's like dust storms or those kinds of things. Uh, it doesn't quite go with everything. Like all of his outfit looks like it's been acquired over time from other people. And he's been asking people what, what's needed. The newest piece is this hat that he wears. Uh, it's it's uh, not black like this, probably. It's more probably like a brown. But it's brand new, and it's definitely from a conversation where someone looked at him and was like, hey, you might want to stop getting hit by the sun all the entire time, or you're going to pass out. Uh, and so that uh, is a message that he's taken to heart. Uh, and he drinks the water very enthusiastically. He's... Uh, what I really want people to think about when they see him is uh, like, he's unassuming. Like if you saw him, you'd be like, this man is not someone who needs to be out on the frontier. But uh, there's an enthusiasm behind him that I think um, is really important also. That like whenever he's inside, like with books or with friends and he feels like he's making a difference, that's when he really lights up. Yeah, Hamish is... A middle-aged man. He's he's about average height. He's lean. Uh, he wears a lot of like he's got a heavy heavy uh, trench coat on and stuff. And uh, that that and he keeps his gun belt underneath it, so it doesn't so so it doesn't always look like he's armed. Uh, he's you know trying to hide his gun because you know that's the best defense. Uh, he has very sharp angular features. Uh, his hair is is definitely in need of a haircut uh and has been for a while and it's just kind of greasy and and kind of pulled back as best he can uh and he's got like it because it, he doesn't really wear a hat so his his the skin on, that it has exposed like on his face it's like it, it's like an old leather catcher's mitt like he's like he's not a and he's he's con he's like drinking his water but also sizing up the the room everyone in it looking for you're not sure if he's looking to steal something or just trying to find the exits or whatever, but he's clearly like, he's paying attention to everything going on. And so as the party drinks their water and, you know, just sort of savors it or enthusiastically downs it or just, just shoots it down in one shot to get it over with because it's foggy. Uh, you notice that like everyone is kind of not paying attention to anybody. They're just kind of doing their things that they were doing before. You're pretty sure that that game of poker that I mentioned before is actually being played for stakes, but you still haven't been able to figure out how they're keeping track of it because they're not doing anything overt. And as you sort of watch all this going on, a tall, skinny white man comes in and he's very clearly american based on his huge blonde handlebar mustache that that goes down and almost in a kentucky waterfall style down and, and go to his sideburns but they don't quite connect uh but he comes in he's wearing a calico vest a blue bandana and everything about him is neat and clean including his very nice leather boots um, that are made out of horse skin, you can tell, but fairly freshly made as if, you know, they recently skinned this horse. Not old leather like everyone else has, but some new leather. And he comes in and looks around, sees the four of you, and nods as he starts to approach. I guess that's our man. 
He gets up howdy. and says, Well, howdy. Y'all be them heroes I was told about. That would be us. Well, Tootin, I'm uh, with Bill the Dingo. That's what they call me around here. Huh. The Dingo? With Bill? The Dingo. On account of I shot a Dingo once. Hmm. Saved a couple little kids. That's all I got on the cancel. Hmm. I mean, to be fair, they were playing what I shouldn't have been, but kill a dingo, save some kids, makes you a hero. At least around here. Sounds about right. Good yeah, enough right. for government work, I guess. Good enough, as it were. So, uh, Council wants to talk to you, I guess. Uh, they got that man you captured, not the one that was dying. I don't think he made it. But they, uh, they had the other one. Got some questions. So, you shall follow me, because I don't quite know what it is that Genji or Huarong have in store for y'all. But they got something brewing. We'll lead the way. Sounds good. Follow me. He takes you actually through the back of the saloon instead of out the front door. As you go through the back of the saloon, you can see these barrels of this water. Uh, they all have marks on them that seem to match. They're the same kinds of marks that you've been seeing on some of the larger placards. Something to indicate a status, um, probably New Jing's symbol of authority. Go through the back room and you enter a back room of another place. This place, while there is no harpsichord music playing, and you didn't know where the entrance was from the outside, it definitely doesn't you know, go to the main street. Uh, you can hear a whole lot of people talking, and you hear this constant wood shattering of these little tokens being moved around and tapped on each other and passed around. And as you pass through the back room of that to where there's a staircase that goes down, you get to see through a doorway, and you can see a whole lot of people smoking cheap stogies, uh, sitting around in this room, and they seem to be playing all kinds of different games of chance. And there are piles upon piles of these tokens being moved around the room. So, the dingo starts down the stairs. He goes, now this way now. And he starts first. Uh, grabbing a lantern that's hanging there as he does, and he just you know turns a little thing, lights it, so he's lighting the way as he goes down the stairs. Who follows, and how do you follow? Hmm. I want to watch the path we're taking in case we need to take it back out. So I'm mm -hmm. being very perceptive as we're like moving mm -hmm. through buildings and, and back alleyways and stuff. Do a quick little intelligence roll for me to see how well you can remember the path. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that is a 67. All right, that's a success. So you can remember this path uh, as you guys go through it so that you can trace back the, the way you came and maybe potentially take the path again on your own later if you would like. Uh, it's, it's you know, just because you're kind of on edge a little bit, you're paying attention. Okay, we turned here, then we turned there, went down the stairs, that kind of thing. I'll bring up the front, like, with the 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 rationale that i'm i'm both large and and resistant so that if you guys need to make a quick retreat i will i will block i will block something heinous okay i don't mean i don't mind being maybe right behind the dingo Hamish. Sounds like uh, Amos Hamish. is going to be right behind the dingo. He was leading the oh. front of your charge. So you can be right yeah, behind him. Sorry, I misunderstood. Um, then I'll be at... I'll be towards the back then. Okay. I'm the last one through. Okay. I had a feeling. That would put Davis right in the center. So it would go Amos, Davis, Cassidy, and then Hamish. Okay. Then really, I only have one question for Hamish as everyone goes down the stairs. Hamish, do you also go down the stairs? Um, I, I 
don't know that he does. He sees all this gambling. He might he might want to go over there. <laughs> Seems fair. Seems fair. Uh, cool. Are you yes, gonna? So, are you gonna so, actually like conceal the fact that you're gonna go go gamble? Uh, I was, yeah, I I'm gonna. Myself. I, I'm thinking he's gonna just try and sneak away from the group. Thirty mm -hmm. under fifty. <laughs> Maybe just just Irish goodbyes, just kind of like step away. <laughs> uh, did you? So if you want to sneak, yeah, that's that's fine. If you want to pull that, I will grant you advantage for that role because everyone is kind of watching the dingo at the moment and heading down the stairs, and you're at the back. So, well, I rolled a thirty with advantage. Okay. It made it worse, so we'll okay. keep the thirty. <laughs> the thirty. All right, Hamish, you managed to sort of tuck away from the group. Uh, do you want to go sit at a table and try to play some hands of chance of something? Or do you want to just scoop up some uh, tokens and head on back? It's up to you. How? I mean, I, I've stolen some stuff. So how likely does it seem like how how secure does it does grabbing a handful of tokens seem like to me? You're pretty swift, so you could probably pull it off. Yeah, then he's he doesn't want to get too far away, so I'm just going to try and I'll, I'll try palming uh, some stuff and and then try and rejoin my my friends. Okay, go for it. Make a palming roll then. All right, let's see. Trying to hit 50 again. We hit 48. Nice. Ooh. All right then. So based on your palming. Uh, it's usually a 1d4 or 1d6. We'll say 1d6 because there's so many tokens laying around. So uh, go ahead and roll a 1d6. Tell me what that Three. number is. How many tokens you have? Three? All right. You take off with eight water tokens as you, um, you know, scoop them up and then move back to your group. Yeah, I just sort. he just sort of... He knows, like, he, he does all that and then heads quickly down the stairs as quietly as he can. <laughs> so as you all come down the stairs, and we're getting near where we were, where I sort of thought we might end for the day, and so here we are. You get to the bottom of the stairs, and you enter this dark room that's very large. Around the room appear to be a whole lot of these barrels that you noticed in the back of the saloon. They all have the symbols on them. As you get down there, you see a group of people. There are, in fact, uh, seven of them. Well, there's six waiting for you, and then Dingo joins the group, and making seven that are standing around. The person that you saw tied up uh, at the gate, he's sort of in the middle of the room. He looks like he's been abused a bit, uh, that he's been manhandled a bit. His mask is missing. His face appears to be bruised and broken, and he's bleeding a little bit. And the tall, lanky, mustache man who told you his name was Dingo, he says, so this here's one of them there fallen immortals. He says, or he told us, after a little bit of persuasion, that his people are up in one of the caves nearby. One of the caves that is one of our mines, and it certainly explains why we haven't heard from the miners in a day. We don't like that. We don't like that at all. So you, I'm guessing you want those miners, want those miners back down from the cave safe and sound is what you're saying? If they're alive, certainly be our thing. And then there's some muttering in a couple of languages around you from the others. And then one says, yes, alive if they are alive. Yeah, what, what what kind of mine this gonna be? Like, you know, is it old salt mine, some 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 ancient ore mine? Like, what 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 are we walking into? They they kind of laugh a bit at your statement, and Dingo goes, <laughs> "Some there's only one kind of mine that manders around here. That'd be a water mine." Okay, I know a thing or two about water mining. I just wants to make sure. Yeah, that's fair. So, let me ask y'all. Is one barrel enough? 
Or you want to negotiate for some more? One mail each? Fair to me. Fair to you. That'll suit uh, me. Uh, would you allow us to? Uh, would you allow us to to parlay for a second? Hmm. Seems step like small playing. Step hey, back for a bit. Wave I you need guys to in. confer with my compatriots. <laughs> and wave y'all all in. I'm inclined. I'm inclined to go for go for one barrel. But Davis, I know you all. I I know you and Cassidy might want more than just water out of this if the opportunity arises. I think as long as we go into these caves with these fallen immortals, we might find out more about what we've been chasing. Uh, at least the rumors. They might have more info. So I'm kind of inclined to just take this offer, unless uh, you want. To get more water out of that? I don't care about the compensation. You all know that. Whatever you think is fair. Hamish? I mean, I'm doing pretty good already, if I do say so myself. And he like flashes a hand, like two pockets full of tokens. Uh, so, you know, this all be, you know, a little sugar on top. Hamish, where did you get all that? Oh, uh, you know. Sold some things. Mm-hmm. When? When? We just got here. Oh, no. Well, you were in the library. Yeah, I bet. Maybe, Hamish, you uh, want to offer a little tip on your way out? Like, like about cleanliness? <laughs> we'll discuss it later. It's, uh... <laughs> Let's go and tell these folks. Tell these folks that we're in. We're in. Uh, we're in the uh, retrieval and rescue business. Sounds about right to me. Well, uh, uh, folks, I do believe uh, that, uh, that your offer for uh, a bail for each of us is a uh, is a fair one. Uh, if you don't mind, my uh, my. Uh, my fellow here, uh, he might want to ask uh, ask the uh, prisoner a few questions himself. Seems reasonable and wise. Bail each. And he snaps his fingers, and some people that you didn't notice in the corners of the room, they kind of move these barrels. You hear the sliding and dragging of these barrels getting pulled forward. They bring four barrels forward. A barrel contains about 36 gallons of water, roughly... 16 days of water if you were to drink it straight. Pretty hefty pay for the job they're asking you to do. Yeah. Uh, But that will be where we end and we'll take off next time interrogating our guy and get into that cave. Nice. Awesome. Thanks everyone for joining us. Yeah, thank you for for running this first part. Everyone, this has been part one of our playthrough of The Few and the Cursed here on Saving Throw Shows, RPG Exploration Society. You can find out more about The Few and the Cursed and uh, and uh, get in on the Kickstarter, which is running right now. Uh, if you hit exclamation point RPGS, RPGES in the chat, it will show you the link so you can find out all the information on that. Thank you, Scott, for running us through this first yes. part. Yes. And now we can we can go around the table and, and let everyone know where they can find you. We'll start off with uh, Ronald. Thank you, Eric. I am Ronald. Uh, you can find me all across the internet as DJ Regular. Uh, it's Twitter, uh, itch.io, which is where you can find my games. And also djregular.tech, uh, tech short for technology. That's my website where you can find out about all the other stuff I do. Awesome. Randy. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Randy Alvarenga. You can follow me on Twitter at Roller Raja. That's R-O-L-L-E-R-R-A-J-A to find out some of the cool stuff I'm doing, which is a lot of actual plays this month and a lot of like really fun October based things. And the last thing is to check out uh, the Megan Caves uh, Savage Worlds game that I'm in called Harbingers. Uh, we're getting ready for season three. I'm heading Ooh. down to L.A. to record that and I'm super excited. nice. Nice. Let's go. Aliza. 
Yeah. Hey, I'm Elisa Pearl. You can find me at Elisa Pearl on Twitter and Instagram, uh, the real Elisa Pearl on TikTok and uh, doing a lot of stuff for October as well. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I have games and I post about them. So if you follow me, you'll see when I go live. Um, and also I was just announced as the game master for a new Clear Skies Star Trek Adventures campaign called Ooh. Perseverance. And it takes place on Utopia Planitia Shipyard. So if you're a Trekkie, you know what that means. If you don't know what that means, that's okay. It just means we're like on a shipyard and our players are all going to be the staff of the shipyard. And some things are going to happen. We'll see what happens. But that's coming in 2023. So I'm just prepping for that and playing some other games and and enjoying gaming. <laughs> awesome. Scott. Uh, I am Scott. Uh, you can find me at Hero170 on um, like Instagram and stuff. And uh, I think my Twitter is actually just at Scott Ewell, spelled U H L S. Um, Hero Studios Gaming, if you Google that, you'll find me. I have stuff on like Drive Through RPG and uh, other places, some adventures out there in the world. So you might, I might pop up on some website, some random place. Um, but mostly right now, we're doing a Kickstarter. So that's in the link. And that's where you can contact me there too if you make a comment seems like me mike and i are basically responding all the time so you know hit us up there if you want to talk about that awesome uh and you can find me mostly eric on all the social media platforms that uh i happen to be on which is most of them probably uh but that <laughs> is uh that is it for tonight's uh rendition of the few and the curse we will be back next week at the same time 6 p.m pacific standard time uh here on saving throw show uh can i just finish off one more Yo. thing yes absolutely i just want to say this is our first session playing this i love this world it's so I do. dope i really enjoy this it's really cool so please y'all check out that kickstarter and support it if you can this is a really really awesome setting in game it's very, very fun. Uh, a wonderful world. And you should definitely check all of that out. But until next week, thank you all so much for tuning in and being a part of this wonderful community. We will see you all some other time. Bye-bye, everybody.